very much for, for being patient with me. I invite Dr. Vergara to come forward and to speak. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for the invitation. I go yes, right? Yes, okay. Um, so today I am going to talk about democracy. And I want to challenge what we understand as democracy today and see it in a, from a different point of view and imagine what democracy could be. So the first part of the talk is going to be um, democracy in history. So what actually democracy has been as a regime type. Uh, then I'm going to um, show you um, some um, examples of some radical thinkers that were in the 18th century uh, that um, projected a new kind of democracy when democracy was being born. Okay, at that crossroads when we need to decide if we go to you know A or B, uh, we took the A route and these other people did the B. So I kind of tried to um, bring it back. And then I will talk about examples, real examples of today, of these experiments on democracy. How have they gone, you know, and how, what can we learn, and what can we learn for uh, Liverpool and beyond, okay? So the first thing to take into account is that democracy, demos and kratos, is the people's power. And we should never forget that. Because when we forget this, we immediately attach democracy to other things, like elections, which is a procedure, a method, right? There's no power in elections. In elections, we give, we elect someone else to rule, and we're giving our power to that person, and then we're withdrawing to our private lives for four, six years, or whatever the term is, right? We don't exercise power. We, the only power that we have today is to elect others to do the governing. So the first democracy in the world uh, was the democracy in ancient <coughs> Athens. It was a city-state and uh, it was governed by one assembly. And here I made a representation of society as a circle, okay? And the circle has um, um, a bottom and a, and, a, and a ceiling in a way. And uh, in the top of the circle are the wealthy elites. They're, they're you know, transhistorical, transnational, they're always there. And the rest of the people, okay? So I situate the position of power, this other circle with other different powers inside, uh, where it was located. So, who manned this, uh, this institution? So in ancient Athens, at the beginning of history, in the 6th century BC, uh, we had the, uh, the Ecclesia, which was the citizen assembly. So all male citizens, uh, male citizens born out of Athenian you know, parents, uh, would be considered as a, able to be in this assembly. And this assembly had legal power, so the power to pass law, had the power to pass judgment, uh, to execute, so basically go and, and, and do policy, policy making, and also to uh, reform the constitution or act as a constitutional court. Okay, those, these powers that we have today in different institutions were inside the same assembly and they were uh, created as subcommittees in a way. So if there was a, a problem uh, a, with, for example, um, water resources and something needed to be done, then the citizens that were in that day in that assembly would put their name forward and they had the first lottery machine. They put their, their name forward if they wanted to be part of the committee to resolve that problem, and they would be selected by lottery to serve in that a, a institution that would have power, either legislative to propose a law or to, uh, to create policy or, um, uh, or judge, okay? And when we had kind of political trials, we had at least a thousand people participating in tribunals. So the people pass judgment, literally the people there. Okay? However, at the beginning of the birth of this democracy, there was only formal democracy. So all male citizens could participate potentially. However, the working classes had to be toiling away. So therefore, even if everybody was formally included, only the wealthy elite could serve because they had time, you know, and money to spend, right? And they, and they, they already had their, their, um, their needs covered and they didn't need to care for children and all these other things are domestic, right? So they would, they had the time to be from the uh, early sunrise to uh, the nightfall. So basically the whole day was spent in government business, so only the elite could do it. 
We fast forward to the 4th century BC, and there was a, a, some, a series of reforms. But at the end, the most important of these reforms was the uh, paid political participation. So we have the famous Perites, who was one of the only elected leaders, and, and here I want to uh, highlight the features of this uh, democracy. Basically, all of the posts were uh, elect, selected by lottery, except for a few of them. One of them was the military post. Those were elected because people needed to have an expertise. The idea of democracy, of political judgment, is that everyone, everybody is the same. So therefore, there's no experts in politics. We all have just political judgment that we need to figure out. So therefore, we're all equals. So the only ones that were elected were the ones who needed expertise, like the military. So Pericles was a military leader. And he understood that the only way that democracy would become material, that the, all of the people really participated, or at least you know, a representative sample of the people who participate, would uh, be if we paid the working classes to actually participate. So this happened, and this became a more material democracy. Uh, and um, of course, all the like, majority of texts that we come, that come from the ancient world were anti-democratic, were pro-aristocratic. So for Aristotle, for example, who is one of the uh, philosophers of democracy, this period of democracy was a corrupt form of democracy because the people were participating. There were, they shouldn't be. They should be toiling away and just be you know, formally included. Okay? Then we have, well, I, and this is the comparison, so how this, uh, the, the Ecclesia, which is the citizen assembly, kind of went down and included the plebeian working classes, you know, the common people, but basically was uh, the, the same institution. Then we have another, another uh, regime, which was the Roman Republic, and this is way more complex, in the sense that there were more institutions with different, uh, with different powers, but the crucial difference with the Athenian democracy is that the working classes, the plebeian, the common people, those who did not have lineage, who were, didn't, were not nobles, they had their own class-based institution, the plebeian council, that met in the forum in Rome, and they had their own exclu exclusive representatives, which were not representatives that we have them today, that we elect them and then we give them a blank check, but they were delegates. They could only do what the council had agreed upon. So therefore, if they wanted to introduce a law, like the famous agrarian laws of the uh, Rakai brothers, yeah, that, uh, that brought down basically the Republic with, with conflict, uh, these tribunes were not acting solo. They were actually being empowered by the council. So this was a, a very specific um, a regime in which the people did have their own institutions to push back against uh, the uh, nobles. So, um, Physically speaking, about you know ge geography of the social geography, uh, the tribunes were situated in between the Senate and the uh, courts of appeals. So they were uh, they they would be called upon by regular citizens to be saved from the nobles or to stop whatever was happening in the Senate. So if the senators were going to pass a law or a policy that was discriminatory, they could step in, open the door of the Senate, and say we veto this, and they had the power to stop. Okay. So, and the feature here is basically that they had a mix of a lottery and, uh, and, uh, and uh, election, but it was mostly election from below. And the problem here is that the Senate, which was, uh, we were in the Senate room, the Senate had the financial power, the power of the purse. So even though they didn't have any features, legal features in the system, so if you took a picture of the formal part of the system, the Senate was an advisory board, but that advice was always followed because the executive power, you know, the magistrates, needed to go and ask for money for the projects. So if they don't follow the Senate's advice, well, next year they will not have the money. So that's how we need to take into account not only the formal power, but also informal power that we have today when we think about corporations and the super wealthy, right? They don't have real institutional power, but they have all the power at the end. The problem was with this regime is that the plebeian elites, so the people's representatives, very easily were co-opted by the patricians via marriage or by being invited to serve in the Senate after being tribunes. So there was a kind of a, a intermingling of the classes, and that uh, that uh, neutralized the uh, the class-based representation. So basically, instead of uh, pushing for a uh, more redistribution, for example, that was needed at some point, they did it. So that allowed for inequality to be so high that when they tried to actually bring it down, it brought civil war. 
Okay, so the system didn't work. In paper, it looked like the plebeian classes had the whole power in the Roman Republic. But at the end, very fast, it crumbled and it became an empire and the, the, the plebeian classes didn't have any power. So this is something also to take into account when we analyze our own democracy. So this is kind of like the, the uh, two by two. And then we have uh, the constitutional monarchy in England. We, you know, fast forward into the Middle Ages and some uh, republics. We can talk about, you know, republics in Italy. Um, but this was the model that endured. So basically, you have the monarch who is uh, kind of becoming, is shrinking in his power, right? And is giving the power to the parliament. And we have the, the House of Lords who are appointed, nobles, and the House of Commons. And they both had kind of veto power over each other, even though the House of Lords was superior in a way, it was the last instance. Today, that has been reverted, the, the, or at least the House of Lords has veto power, but never exercised it, or very rarely. And now it's weird that it has become kind of a more progressive than even the House of Commons itself, but this is something else. So uh, here in this, in, in this uh, model, we have that only property owners were able to vote and were able to be elected, okay? So this is a constitutional monarchy that would become a constitutional democracy based on wealth. And this happened everywhere, and then this was dismantled and, and opened to everyone, okay? So the, the, the model of democracy that is imperative throughout the, the developing world, we have parliamentarism in Europe, then a, a mixture with presidentialism. Today, presidentialism is the most uh, uh, go-to regime in the world, okay? So this is the kind of uh, the regime that was copied. That was the first democracy in the world, the uh, institutional democracy, and it was copied. So you have at the, at, the, at the very top, you have all the power. You have the executive and the legislative and the uh, judiciary. And the checks and balances meant that each power could veto, could stop the action of the other powers. So ambition would counter ambition. And this is what comes from James Madison and the other philosophers. And in the US, at least at the, at the beginning of the 19th century, all the 70% of the people were property owners, were yeoman farmers. So the opposite of Europe. In Europe, only around 10% of the population had property, the rest were property less. In the US, because it was a settler state, right, they had, a, the majority of people had land. So they could vote, you know, in a the, way. The, the citizenship was attached to property. So it's a property owner owning democracy. So at the beginning of democracy, it worked out because the majority of people were property owners and they would select among themselves supposedly the best, right? However, when we look at the law and, and what, uh, what are the features that you needed to be a governor or a president or a senator, you needed to have way more wealth than just the property, right? You're already, the wealthy elites were the only ones that could be elected. So we could elect and the property less or the slaves were out. Then we fast forward to today, and what happens is that the majority of people are property less today. So we're not talking about owning your house, we're talking about owning the means of production, right? This is the idea of the wealth, right? So today, the majority of wealth is at the very top, and uh, as, as, as in the majority of the world today, except for a few um, exceptions in, in, in Europe and Singapore and other places where there is more equality, but the majority of people are property less, and even though all the wealth requirements were stripped. Only wealthy or very well connected people are able to be candidates and be elected. So, again, formally, we can be elected, all of us, right? But at the end, the people that are actually candidates and can be elected are they're a tiny minority, they're well connected, uh, or they have wealth, okay? So, we are back to this, uh, to um, kind of a, a, a more a formal democracy more than a material democracy. And this, and this basically means that the wealthy, are de facto controlling politics, either legally or uh, informally. Okay? And this is uh, the, the, the two by two, but this is basically we only have the power to select. And then I want to um, show you uh, what uh, basically my own uh, proposal comes from, and, and this idea of organizing from below is that you need to basically fill the space of the plebeians, of the working classes, those from below, and give institutions from below. So for Condorcet, who was writing the constitution for France at the other side of the ocean, right? He criticized heavily the US. He said, this thing that you have created, that this division of powers and checks and balances, policing among elites, is not going to work. 
It just obscures the corruption because nobody takes responsibility in a way. And the people are not there to keep you honest. The people are the only power that people organize that are not in politics, but can actually monitor politics, are the ones that can, that can uh, keep the system running and non-corrupt. So the issue here is to free the republic from corruption. So he says the only way to do it is to actually have the representative government, as we have it today. We select others to do the basic administration and ruling because we need people to actually de devote it to that. But the people need to be organized and need to have the power to stop things that they think they're oppressive or to initiate things that are not being initiated because sometimes the best way to not deal with things and not to redistribute is to actually not talk about them, right? So to initiate and to judge and to monitor the government. So he created this uh, network of primary assemblies and this uh, came not from you know, his imagination only, but from the uh, crumbling of the regime in France. So the moment that the, the third state is called in France in the, during the revolution, they, all of the people in the realm started to organize at the local level to petition. So they drafted laundry list of demands, basically, by hand, and then by horse, they brought it to the third state. So he said, well, these people already met. They're already, they have their local assemblies in their little village. Why don't we institutionalize that? So people actually get together, and when they, they see that something is needed, they can actually do something about it, okay? So he created this model in which you need to, every local assembly needs to go and get to a simple proposition. If you want to do something, you distill it to a simple proposition, to one line, something so basic that anyone can understand it, from the child to your grandparent, anyone. It's not complicated. And that could be uh, deliberated in each assembly, accepted or rejected. And the moment that you get a threshold and get a, a mass, a critical mass, then that becomes the expressed will of the people. And not what we have now that everybody thinks that the people speak through a plebiscite or a referendum in which nobody has deliberated, nobody has thought about it, we just vote, right? That is a will that is not, that is from the gut or from propaganda, but not really from our reason. So he says the only way to have a real democracy is for people to meet, to organize, to deliberate amongst each other, to educate themselves, and then express their will, but not express their will indirectly, in a way, through the representatives. And for him, this is very important, citizens are residents. So is, there's no nationality in this way, there's no, uh, the problem of immigration for him, it's not a no-go. You needed to have the, the decision-making power at the local level, and whoever is there needs to make that decision. So very radical in a sense. So what can we think about? How can we think about democracy for the 21st century? Because today we have basically a representative government and we are powerless and we know it. And they make consultations on us and we you know, go and vote in the consultation and then nobody cares about the results. And if they don't like it or people don't vote because they're already apathetic, because why would you vote if there's nothing coming out of it? Why go places if you don't have no power? So, and then people, the experts say, well, people are apathetic, people are ignorant, people, you know, really don't want to engage in politics. Like, if they, if nobody goes and, and does their duty, basically. But you have no structure, you have no support, you have no, no power, so why do it, right? So we need to think, uh, we really think about it. And uh, following this lead of Condorcet and the high levels of corruption that we have today, so today, two thirds of countries around the world that are democracies are, as, as Transparency International says, completely corrupt. Like, it's really, there's only a few places in the world that actually uh, pass the test in a way of like minimal corruption and they actually work, right? And they're only featuring, they're only looking at actual crimes being committed. And we know that it's very difficult today to follow the money. We cannot really have a corruption trial and follow the money and put people in jail. It's very difficult. The only thing that you need to do is pay someone in a tax haven that is untraceable. And that's it, right? So it's very difficult to actually say you are corrupt and you're going to jail. So basically we need other ways to get rid 
not kill, get rid of the politicians that are corrupt, right? Uh, in a manner that that's not require the judicial system to get kicked in, because then you have reasonable doubt and you have all these other things because you're putting people in jail. We can get rid of people that are corrupt and get the bad apples out of the you know the basket without having to go the judicial route, down the route. So therefore, we need these institutions that are people based. So I think that the democracy for the 21st century, we need to think about institutions and also mechanisms that, uh, through which the common people can actually exercise power. Not just be consulted, not just elect others, but actually have power and um, take, take advantage of the numbers because the people are always stronger when they're together. Yeah. So one thing is to think about local assemblies. That the, the idea that we need to have uh, spaces for getting together and this deciding uh, at every, in every town, in every village, in every neighborhood. And this is not only for the people to express themselves, but also to bring diversity to places that are today reified. reified. If we think about, for example, ethnic communities, neighborhoods of ethnic, or maybe even towns of basically one homogeneous ethnic community, that community will not be diverse within because they are fighting against others, right? They are uh, identifying as a solid, you know, culture vis-a-vis -vis others. However, if we would have local assemblies in each place of that ethnic group, maybe diversity will come up, and there will be a more richness instead of a reified border between the others and us. So, in a way, less polarized society if we can meet at the local level with our neighbors, right? That we are there are more diverse neighborhoods. Uh, also, popular juries, something that was a, a, a cornerstone of democracy, today is completely devalued. For example, in the United States, uh, something that you, when we see, I don't know if you watch you know, TV, all the jury, jury uh, trial, you know, um, uh, series and stuff that is in, in, in the US, people love it, you know, the, the people's judges and the people passing judgment. This is not true. 96% of the crimes go to plea bargain. So they don't go to trial because they, 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 the, the um, lawyers, basically threaten the client saying, if you go to trial, you're gonna get way worse. So just say you're guilty, get you know three months and let's you know get over it. So the, there's no juries anymore, very few of them. So the cornerstone of democracy, the idea that you need to be judged by your peers, not by different people. So judges are different people. Judges are from the 10 wealthiest percent or even 20. But the 20%, you know, they, they're part of the elite. They're not part of the common folk. So if you commit a crime, that is, for example, stealing a cell phone or something like that. The judicial system could, you know, put you in jail for three years. But you know, this is something so minor in a way. Why maybe your community would be more, you know, go this way? Maybe you need something else. Maybe you need, you know, subsidies for your life. Why are you doing this? Whatever. More humane in the sense. We have gotten rid of that. We need to bring it back. The idea that we need to be judged by our peers and by the judge only. Uh, then uh, the uh, setting up of people on Bundesman offices, protectors of the people. These offices are not, are not new, they're from the end of the, of the 1960s, however, they were created without binding power. And uh, they, uh, they were, um, they were uh, basically became formal in a way, it became uh, offices which uh, it served a purpose at the beginning to kind of monitor government and monitor the pattern of violation of human rights. For example, you have the right to clean water, for example, and you don't have it. You need to go to the court and say, my right is being violated, please do something about it. But there's no kind of class action. There's no kind of like, oh, a whole community is being deprived of this human right. So therefore, an office would take care of that pattern and actually force legislation or force the executive to actually spend the money. Because the judges, even if they say, oh, your human rights are being violated, they cannot force anyone to spend money on anything because that is separation of powers. And this is a problem, right? Uh, we know that human rights are being violated everywhere, you know, from housing to education to healthcare, but nobody does anything about it. And it's always individually based and it's not community based. In Chile, we have three, uh, in the constitutional draft, we have three uh, protectors of the people. One of human rights, of socioeconomic rights. One for nature. So if you're going to have, you know, the, if nature is going to have rights in the sense that it needs to be protected, who is going to protect it? Who is going to stand up for nature? It needs to be an institution. 
And that institution is to be you know, selected from the ground up, not from above, because then it's neutralized. So this, and, and the other uh, office was the Office for the Defense of Children, because children have rights, but again, nobody defends those rights. So they need a specific institution for that. And finally, uh, we need direct, direct democratic mechanisms. Okay? We need to be able, because we are the people, the sovereign supposedly, if we believe that democracy is people's power, then we need mechanisms to exercise this power. And this power is legislative, is judicial, is constitutional. So we need mechanisms as initiative of law and policy. We need the initiative to repeal law that is corrupt, that is discriminatory. Uh, we need to recall representatives if they, if they don't do a good job. The idea that we need to put up with a corrupt politician for four or six years because that is you know, their mandate and we cannot get rid of them in, in the between. Like, what kind of job is this? You know, it's like any job, you do a bad job, you get fired. You know, this is how it is. So at least the same should be applied to politicians. So we need to have that power. And then finally, to reform the constitution. The idea that we are going to have set basic principles that are going to endure through our history without any changes, and basically that the changes are um, based uh, are, are going to be uh, gate, uh, going to be based on gatekeepers that people uh, from the Senate or whatever are the ones deciding, really is not benefiting the people. If you think, and this is something that also I take from Condorcet and also from Machiavelli. Constituent power, the power to create the basic structure, to rethink the basic law, to incorporate new rights, no? new institutions are necessary. <coughs> this is something that we need to, this update to the mainframe is something that is needed periodically and should not be reactive. We should not get to a collapse of our society and then change the constitution like an outburst like it's happened in Chile and now I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about that. Um, so, but we need to periodically, kind of critically, look at our society, look at ourselves, of how, how far have we come, or, or the gap between what we thought it was good and what we actually have, and then propose different form, reforms to that mainframe, in a way. And that is something that should be done in order to keep corruption and the oligarchization of power, the grabbing of power by the people on top, under control. Okay. So, uh, and this is part of the, the, also the theme um, that you're going to see with John Alexander, yes, in uh, uh, the next session, uh, is that to, today we are political consumers, we are fed propaganda from party A to party B, ideologies here and there, and we buy it, we buy, we bid, we bid like in a, in a horse race, right? We need to pass from that, which is very passive, to being political agents. So we do the politics in a way. The others are waiting to implement those politics. But the decisions that are crucial, there are ethical decisions that we need, need to be made, meaning they need to be made by the people themselves and not by the representatives, because the representatives are co-opted by special interests and they also reify positions. I'm gonna one example. If I hear in we're in a Catholic town, so if you have um, for example, you are a you know strong Catholic conservative and you vote for a conservative politician that uh, basically is Catholic, you, you can change your mind in terms of, for example, abortion. You can say, well, you know, I am against abortion, but I would be okay for abortion in these cases, or, you know, I see the problem in, the, in my community and this needs to be addressed. I understand that it's a public policy, right? And I, as an individual, I can change my mind after deliberating with my peers. However, a politician cannot change his mind because that would be treason. You are voting for a platform that they cannot just say, oh, I came to power and now I changed my mind and for abortion now. You cannot do that. So therefore, when we, when we elect representatives, we're reifying and polarizing our own views and not allowing them to change and mutate according to you know, what we experience, the lived experiences of ourselves and our neighbors. So therefore, representation is actually allowing for polarization. And the only way to go against that is to organize at the local level. So what I propose, and this is the, the idea of the people as network, that we cannot just unite. The idea that we are the people that are unite in one front and one, one people, that is, has never been the case, and is never the case now. We are very diverse, and therefore we need to connect the different organizations, the different peoples that exist in their communities through a network. And here I take inspiration of plants. 
So uh, I don't know if you, I, I recommend this documentary, A Fantastic Fungi, uh, is about uh, fungi and the mycelium, which is the roots of all the fungi that is all over the world. Basically, below the crust, the earth, there, there is a, a, a layer of mycelium, and the, all the species, all vegetable species, connect to each other through the grid. They don't connect to each other, they talk to each other chemically, but not directly, but through this mycelium. So the mycelium is the network. So I think that that is the way to understand people's power. is decentralized, is horizontal, there's brains in every assembly, and therefore popular wisdom and popular um, knowledge is built from the very diverse points everywhere. So there's not like a unity, it's a grid that articulates, that connects us all in a way. So here I want to briefly uh, make a, a, a distinction between election and rotation because some of the problems of local organizations is that they mimic what we know and the methods that are used in democracy, which is election, right? So election uh, is the selection of the best among us. So immediately we're making a difference between the leader and the grassroots, even in small organizations. Uh, the selected have the monopoly of the political knowledge. So whatever they're doing is they're, uh, they're uh, managing the, the social relations, they're managing the agenda, whatever they're doing, that knowledge is monopolized by few that are, become experts and they become uh, someone that you cannot get, you know, you need them. If they get sick they, they, or they, they, they move away, then there's a vacuum and nobody can do that job because nobody knows. Then you have uh, they concentrate power, this is of course because the executive decision making needs to be, you know, uh, decision needs to be made fast. And this of course uh, it fosters the idea of re-election, that we need this person in this post because the only person that knows, and of course he or she is the best in that position, makes more prone to corruption because that person is there and is more accessible to being influenced. On the other hand, we have rotation and sortition, lottery. This is very inclusive because it doesn't demand any type of expertise. This, uh, in order to use this method, you need collective uh, decision-making bodies. It cannot be one person, at least three. And one of the, that those persons needs to rotate out every two or three months. So a new person comes in and learns from the other two, and then you rotate out. And this is the idea that uh, this is the method that they use in the ancient Athenian Republic. Uh, for collective knowledge. So people, nobody knows anything, you learn by doing, so you teach the others, the newcomers, and you pass the post, okay? Uh, it's very expansive, and this uh, creates uh, expansive collective learning, because everyone could actually pass through those posts of power, and they learn how it is. It's very easy when, when you know, you're, if you're leading an assembly, and you're the one with the time, and you're like always, okay, you know, talk less, or you, you, you know, you need to move on, and then if you're always in the audience, you're always kind of upset, like, oh, you're cutting me off, you know, this is not okay. But when you have been doing the timing, you understand it's very difficult and you need to, that, you know, scarce time, this is the time is the most precious of all uh, resources. So everybody needs to stick to their time. So there's a knowledge that also creates empathy to the people that are doing that role and that, that knowledge changes you in a way and makes you better. Um, it also uh, allows for an anti-oligarchic dispersion of power, the idea that you, that you cannot just bribe one person, that person will rotate out and he has to you know, uh, deal with the others. So it's, very, it's not corruption free, but it's a method that actually allows for, um, for a eliminated corruption, at least in the, in the short term. Okay? And uh, again, uh, this, the, this idea of imagining these plebeian institutions, these institutions for the common people, and not for all, because when we talk about institutions for all, the problem is that the rich and the most powerful or the most knowledgeable will co-opt that. Because if we have the people that are trained within the common people, immediately the common people will defer. There is a hierarchical thing that happens when someone is more authoritative in the room, right? And you get, you know, um, and we can talk about uh, uh, some tips that I have been uh, testing in the different groups in order to dismantle the oligarchic logic within the organizations. Because in local organizations, we also have experts. We also have professional activists that actually do all the talking, right? And there's a, you need to actually dismantle that. Um, so we have this network of local assemblies that can do many things, and then you, can, you need to have like a coordinate um, institution, attribute it, a delegate, 
right? So you can have delegates from the organizations in a local, in, in, a, in a national institution that could actually interact with government, right? Because you cannot just have a network and then something is deciding and nobody follows up. Someone needs to go and fight it, right? Someone needs to go and force that decision to be materialized. So you need another institution as a coordination. Yeah. Um, and then this is the, the, the for you to visualize uh, the kind of like the model of what could happen. This is that could be either at the local level, at the regional level, or the national level. So you have an assemblies at every in every neighborhood. Then you have a collection of those assemblies in the provincial or municipal, whatever the jurisdiction is. Then you have the regional and then the national. And the idea is that at every level you have a coordinated body that would. Uh, deliver whatever decision was made at the local level to the next level. So there's solidarity and this idea that when something is decided in one assembly, it immediately goes to the other assembly to be discussed. So even if we, for example, are an environmental organization and we only care about you know green stuff, but then there is another organization that is labor-based and they have an issue, we will not care about that issue. However, if that issue comes to our assembly and we are we need to say yes or no to it, we can actually agree to it in solidarity with other organizations, even if it's not our beat, you know, it's not our thing. And the same can happen with the labor organization. So there is an exchange of demands that could trigger solidarity in order to create this critical mass in order to push uh, for government to take it up. Uh, and the ideal situation here would be that government would devolve power that whatever the people decide would be the final say, and they, that would be a mandate for the government to actually act. And here is not, and we're not talking about self-government here. We're not talking about we governing ourselves, like supplanting representative government. We need those guys, unfortunately, because people need to run things. However, we're the boss. When we talk about an, a corporation, there's always the board of directors, right? Or the you know, CEO. The people is the CEO. The, man, the other guys do all the work, right? But we call the shots when it's necessary. We give our representatives a lot of freedom to do whatever. But the moment that the, the ship needs to be stirred in a different you know, manner, then the people need to uh, express themselves and uh, do uh, make decisions. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about these two examples that I brought. One is from Mexico and the other from Chile of organizing that is kind of follows this, uh, this model. Uh, in an intuitive manner. Uh, so in Puebla, Mexico, one of the most conservative places in Mexico, there are more than 350 churches actually in this town. Um, it, people are very conservative and they don't, they, they don't steer, they're, they're not protesting at any way. Uh, uh, it's not their style. You know? And there are a lot of indigenous communities. So there was this um, a French company, Danone, uh, who came uh, to uh, bottle the water because the water in that place is very, very special. Okay, for comes from below and it's very special. So they came and they said to the government, "Oh, we're just going to bottle this water, but we're not going to affect the water of the city and all the communities. We're just going to—it's not going to have any effect." However, one year, two years, all the uh, the crops started dying, the animals started dying, all the wells dried up. So all the indigenous communities that lived from farming, they were you know, being deprived. So one of the communities that were more militant, they started organizing. So they went town by town, going to all the communities that were dispersed and uh, saying, well, we need to stop this. We need to stop this, this, uh, this uh, company from extracting our water. So they did a consultation. Of course, it was not binding, but they amassed all these people and they, uh, and they socialized the idea. And the consultation that they did approved the, you know, the prohibition of this, of, the, of this company. Of course, the government didn't care. So with the support of all the indigenous communities that live in the mountains, basically, that are not connected, they took over this place, they shut it down, and immediately the, the water started to uh, come out of the wells again, and all the, the vegetation came back. Right? And they were in this place for nine months. Nine months, and they converted this place into the La Casa de los Pueblos, the house of the peoples, and the peoples with an S, right? With many peoples. It's not just one people, but is there is diversity within. So they are pushing for um, connecting with other communities because they said, now this, this company, they shut down here, but they moved to the other state. 
to walk away, basically. And because we cannot connect, we cannot really share our knowledge and the modus operandi of this, you know, uh, company. So they're going to do it again. And if you think about it in a global scale, they do it, you know, they go to the developing world. And if they cannot do it here, they're going to do it elsewhere. So the, we need to organize at the global level to resist the extractivism and the pollution of, you know, the earth in general, right? So uh, there's something that is transnational. And the other example is Chile. So, um, as you might know, in October 2019, there was an uprising due to, you know, um, increasing the metro fare. Uh, the people went out in mass and they demanded a constituent process. We have a constitution made by Pinochet, the dictator. We still have it. It has been reformed more than 200 times, but it's still there. Okay? And it created a neoliberal system that privatized everything and uh, made everything, you know, everything is private. You need to pay for everything. So, therefore, if you have no money, you have nothing. Right? So we have the 20%, the richest 20% live like in Europe, and the rest lives in one of like in the, more, in the poorest countries in the world, basically. So that's the level of inequality. So this kind of um, uh, burst and uh, uh, a constitutional process was made, and there's a lot of faults with the process. However, there was a, a way to uh, participate, and you needed to um, uh, get 15,000 signatures to pitch your idea of an article for the Constitution to the Convention, okay? And you got your 10 minutes of fame in the Convention to actually push for your article. So many of the, you know, pressure groups did this. However, the people are not organized, very difficult. And so I, I was part of uh, trying to organize the com housing committees. So the committees of the people that do not have housing, okay, that are living in encampments. So they wanted to push for a right to housing. but for dignified housing, for decent housing, for humane housing, and not just the right to housing. So they wanted to draft from their own lived experience the, 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 the right that was needed. So they actually did. We, they came together and in, they did they, 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 local assemblies of these committees, and they came with articles that they did themselves with no, you know, just common knowledge. And that was passed, and that actually was in the Constitution. And if it would have been approved, it would have been one of the most revolutionary um, um, articles and, and constitutions of the world. Okay? Uh, however, this failed. Why? Because the, the only people that were into this process were the activists. The population at large, they were completely apathetic because the part political parties are so corrupt that they didn't believe in the system. So therefore, they were fresh for propaganda. Okay, so here I want to make a parallel between Brexit and what happened in Chile. So imagine this was an objectively better constitution. On the one hand, we have the Pinochet made constitution that everybody understood that it was a no-go. And then you had the other side of constitution that were the majority of constitutional scholars saying, this is the most progressive thing ever written. Maybe it's just too much, but it's great, you know. And of course, we know constitutional scholars know that what is written is not really what is done, right? So it's like an aspiration, if you will. So even if you, you know, apply a very uh, a brief to a very radical constitution, that doesn't mean anything. At the end, it's all what is going to be, how it's going to be implemented. It will take 10, 20 years, right? So the propaganda was so intense that they made the people believe that the right to housing was actually bad for them because the state would take over your house somehow. And this was a lie that was told, and uh, uh, people believed it. And people, they played to the fear. So the idea that now we have nothing, we have uh, my house was very small, not decent, but it's mine, that the state is going to take over because basically I received subsidies from the state. So 80%, no, 50% of the people in Chile received subsidies for their houses, okay? So imagine you're talking about the 50% of the people being afraid that the state will take over their house. And that was completely lie. There was not, nothing there. It was actually there, there was a right won by the grassroots who were involved. But this was not enough because people were not educated. And when people are educated from below, they're only watching TV. And the TV is, you know, controlled by, you know, oligarchic interests in a way that they want the things to remain the way that they are and not change. So therefore, you have a whole establishment against change. And even the most, you know, wealth thought of and then, you know, grassroots led process didn't work out. So this is a, a model and also a challenge for future organizing and if we're going to actually get things done and not be a victim of propaganda. And I think this, uh, with this I finish, is all about uh, popular pedagogy. 
a popular pedagogy that is um, that we learn together in a way at the local level, exchanging our life's experiences. And this is what happened in Chile. The moment that the uprising happened, people, people who were in a very neoliberal society that were uh, scared of a, being ratted out by your neighbor, imagine from coming from the dictatorship, no one talks about politics. Those people went for the first time out to the streets. They met in the local squares throughout Chile and they created local assemblies because they needed to talk. And they, when they started to talk, they understood that what they happened to them, their own failures, individual failures, they were not individual. It was a structure because everybody had the same stories. So basically, they met and they created something new and they demanded change. But then it didn't work out. It's something that we need to learn from. But it's completely doable. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, I'm going to move to David and Andy just to give a little perspective on what we've heard, just some brief comments, how you've heard and, and, and what you hear. You, you no more than five minutes, preferably three. <laughs> We're going to Andy first. <laughs> there's, a, there's a nice uh, power to the LGBT. Yes. I mean, that, that's kind of the perspective I'm coming from. It certainly is a local NGO um, level of how that network of people send is, is possible. Um, I think from our perspective, it's certainly about how do we influence that on behalf of the LGBT plus community? Well, how can we represent that community? Well, obviously, within our communities, how can we say that we represent them as well and how that's constructed, I guess. So it'd be really interesting to know about how um, communities can come together in the same way. Um, for instance, tomorrow, um, we're in Cardiff at the UK Pride Conference, and it'd be amazing that us as private organisations could gather the news tomorrow and of our communities and influence in that way in a coordinated way. But the reality for us at the moment is really disrupted and that we've got one one volunteer organising one time festival to the large organisations that employ people. So how can we consistently farm that information to feed it back as well, I guess, is <coughs> something that really is really interesting for us. Um, I guess as well is that that let's say the idea of um, using experts in the right places. So um, our board, so those people that employ me are I'm obviously on a rotation and that's exactly it. We want to keep it fresh even though they maybe not don't know as, as much as um as, as everybody else mind you, it, it keeps it rotating, they keep learning about the organisation whereas they employ myself as the event manager because we bring expertise. So it's, it's I guess again how that how that fits into that I think for me. Um but yeah, it's truly really interesting how we influence that, but then also how do we open ourselves up to be more representative. So for instance, as we're seeing kind of nationally attacks on uh, trans and non-binary communities and how we mobilise that. But as an organisation that maybe doesn't always get the engagement from those communities in the first place, how can we do that? Or could they, as a community, have their own? Do you know what I mean? I don't, that's, that's what I'm trying to, to picture for myself. So I think that, that's the really interesting part of how, how we can collectively do that, but then how do we share and how that will work on a large scale, really, um, is a question. Um, it's more of a question than a statement, really. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's about how we do that. And from a local level, I'm a, a city town resident. I um, obviously participate in whether it's a person organizer, putting notices and licenses and things in, which is very much a paper exercise. You put a notice on that post, no one, no one takes part because they're, why should I know this is going to happen anyway? So again, how we as local residents can, can do that more is it, again, bodies that engaged and then discuss issues that can then influence the values of the waterfront and then engage organizers every year. Residents come together and it has the year off for people that have the power. So I guess just yeah, how we might formalise that, I guess, as a local level, or should it be, as, as we mentioned, about neighbourhoods, visit neighbourhoods rather than communities? And, yeah. <coughs> um, it's really interesting to talk about getting rid of politicians and Jeremy or anyone just get rid of one. Yeah. So many of you know, <laughs> um, I think Liverpool's a really interesting case study for this because obviously we exist in a, a legal and political framework that and the best party politics. Um, but in Liverpool, talking about power as citizens, we have a, a ward, our local elections, of the system of, of choosing representatives is being fundamentally changed with no input from citizens, really. Um, there's a, a consultation, as you said, but the, the outcome of the consultation was very similar to what the City Council proposed, and considering it was the City Council that got us into the mess in the first place, maybe they shouldn't be marking their own homework. Um, there's also, we adopted a mayoral model for our local council without consultation, one of, the, uh, one of the only cities to do so, every other city got a vote on that, um, and then we will now have the mayoral system removed, 
um, with no consultation again because of party politics. Um, and so I think Liverpool's a very interesting case study as a city that is seen as political with a small P, um, but actually when it comes down to the formal politics with a capital P, uh, there's not much of a role for the citizen. Um, and I think you see that in declining turnout, and I think you see that in people's indifference to party politicians uh, more broadly. And you're going to see the, the latest uh, scandal in, in um, City Hall about um, how bids are, are put through and how they're, they're purchased. I do wonder though if you could explain um, maybe in the comments some more about what to do when when bringing people together doesn't give you this progressive outcome that is kind of seems assumed. I mean, I think if you've got but if you look at public opinion, I mean, for most of this century, the public would have brought back the death penalty. Uh, they they would be ghastly to uh, to people coming across the channel on boats, um, and ghastly to, to people like in the 90s, teenage mothers, single mothers. Um, so what happens? How do you and how do you work disagreement out in this system? Because ultimately, there needs to be an arbiter, surely somewhere. And is that a majoritarian of these, of these local communities that essentially? Uh, a majority system, or, um, or or is there another another method? But I thought it was really interesting how they thought the way back, all the way back to the 60s, all the way to the present day, was really illuminating um, the house of that. So. Thanks very much, Andy and, and David. Uh, no, not no. <laughs> We've had your moment. Um, just want to give all of you a quick chance to uh, just talk. Turn around to people you can come with. Um, what have you heard? What have you liked? What are your, the questions you'd like to consider now? So just two minutes, just have a quick chat around you with, with other people. So please make sure you talk to somebody else you didn't come with. OK, we have one value that we, we operate all the time, and that is um, if a man speaks, a woman will always follow. So Camilla just said, you start with women. So we'll start with women tonight. So, our first question needs to be a oh, woman. So would anybody, any women in the audience like to ask a question? Alison. First of all, I'd like to say your energy and enthusiasm is really inspiring. And I think most of us feel this sort of sense of love and anxiety about the state of the world at the moment. And to feel like, you know, we should just get back to basics and talk about it is, is really great. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, did you, you know, a few years ago somebody started the PP Club for the People in London, I think it was 2017, um, and when I saw the first, the first talk was with um, Yanis Varoufakis and Hamid Pesifa, um, and they sort of launched it with great enthusiasm, this is the answer to, to teach people how to be involved, how to think, how to analyse, how to feel a sense of power. Um, and it just died a death. And, you know, I always thought if I won the lottery, that's the thing I would want to do, open PPE clubs for kids all over the country. Do, do you know if, if anything like that is going on anywhere? So, yes, thank you for all the questions. So, I'm going to answer yours first. Um, yeah, there's no... Um, so the, the, the creation of spaces to assemble, this is crucial, and it's not done. And, but the problem is that those spaces need to be sustained. They need to have something else than just politics. Because we don't do just politics. We, you, we do community. So you need to have a space that is multi, has multiple uh, things to you know, happening in that place. So we cannot just think about you know, political, because that is going to die a slow death, because there's no power. If that institution or that space had power to decide this, we would be cut. But it's not. Right? So power is, you need to take power. And for taking power, you need to be assembled. You need to be in numbers. You, know? you need to have a legitimacy a claim. You know, to claim it. Right? So um, there are spaces being taken in places, uh, occupied. But uh, there's one initiative that is very interesting in uh, Denmark. Uh, there is uh, one uh, democracy garage. And it was, I was telling um, 
and uh, the story about this woman that wanted to create a space and said, oh, I want the lottery. Yeah, it was not the lottery, it was COVID. So she said, oh, there's not the, I, I, we cannot do outreach, we cannot do the festivals, what we can do? And she bought this all, you know, uh, storage space and converted it into a kind of co democracy community center. And she has a bakery, she has a cafe, she has a, a space for music, a space a venue for you know, talking, for gathering. So people just go there. And it's a place full of life. And that is democracy, a place that we share where there's childcare, there's, you know, there's uh, food, right? There are entertainment also. And it's, it's not only about politics. So I think if we think about you know, creating these spaces, this is the type of spaces that we need because people cannot do politics with empty stomachs and with you know, small kids clinging of you, right? We need to actually have space to do that. So the community needs to support. Um, so in terms of uh, the uh, how to do it, solidarity uh, among these different um, spaces and uh, groups. Because when you're talking about, you know, the gay community or the environmental community, there are silos, right? There, there are very small groups that push for their own agenda. and There's no solidarity among them. They are singly based. And uh, this is something that is going to keep us apart. And uh, even, uh, as I said before, you need to pass along, you know, the code. And this is part of the, kind of the idea of editing the mainframe. That when we pass information from one uh, from one piece of our software to another, it needs to be a, a code that could be, could be read. So therefore, it needs to be something simple, not a five-page statement, which is the classical thing that you know activists do. <laughs> and 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 you need to reach out. And the idea is that you are you know every community that is active is a minority. They're all minorities. So as minority, you're not going to do anything. You need the uh, the solidarity of the other groups. So we need to understand that we need to cross that line and that your your code is going to be read by the other assembly is going to say yes and my code you're going to read it and you're going to say yes and this is solidarity, actual solidarity. So I think this is a way and we have been working on a platform um, trying to get some funding for this but it's basically a people's platform, a connecting platform that would allow for us to, for each group to broadcast, to advertise their own you know, gains and their own demands, and then to pass this code, to upload it into the mainframe for the other assemblies to take it up and to say yes or no, and to trace it. And we have, for example, technologies like blockchain that could, um, that basically any decision, you could trace back all the, all the people who accepted that decision forever, you cannot be manipulated, nobody can. So the idea that you can have actual decisions accepted by communities, by collectives, um, uh, that could uh, gather support for something and could stay there and everybody can see how legitimate it is because we can have people adhering to it, right? So, and you need to start small. You need to start with the organizations that they actually exist. You cannot go and say, oh, let's go and organize. No. You have people already organized, they need to be connected in the mycelium, right? In the network. So I think that is the first stage to have like a critical mass of different organizations that are willing to collaborate and are willing to say yes to the demand of the other because it makes sense, not because it's your demand. So there's no uh, competition of demands, which is happens now, but actually a solidarity and a plan. They're going to say, oh, we can agree to this. We're going to fight together. And this, I think this is, this is the way to do it by stages. Um, and the question here, uh, and this is a very interesting question that many people do with the idea of, uh, people are not progressive in general, like the, or, or we cannot expect, we, we understand that the people that are organized are more progressive and we, we expect more progressive outcomes from the people. But the reality is that people are not across the board progressive. Actually, there are a lot of conservatives, right? And people are very afraid of change. But from my perspective, democracy is not about ideology. It's not about being progressive. It's about being, giving people's, people power. And when we get, give people power, we cannot just give power just like that, in a way. Uh, the ancient democracy had limits, had constitutional limits. We have constitutional limits. We are limited by human rights treaties. So our sovereign will needs to be constrained by those limits. So whatever you propose to be you know, the code, whatever demand you want to put forward, it needs to be in agreement with human rights. So you cannot reestablish the death penalty because that goes against human rights. You cannot you know, eliminate abortion if it already exists because that is a human right, actually, in the Declaration. So, on all the, the declarations of the UN. So, therefore, you have like a legal system that you need to incorporate into your own decision making, and therefore, you then uh, eliminate the possibility of a fascist 
a resurgence that is going to be legitimized by the people, right? So the people need to also educate themselves on what are the limits that we have gathered as an international community that is protective of people's rights and not going and being fed propaganda to undermine those rights, right? So in Chile, uh, it was this was a part of the um, direct democratic mechanisms. So you cannot propose anything that goes against human rights. Human rights. So you know that from the start. Okay. Other other uh, rules are very important in order not to replicate the the classic oligarchic or patriarchal rules um, inside the organizations. Is that you need to have foundational rules. Any assembly has needs to have constitutional basic rules that are agreed upon by the people. So, for example, uh, who participates in these assemblies? If you allow politicians to participate in the assemblies, if you are like, allow priests to participate in the assemblies, right? If you allow anything, anybody that has power, power legal or uh, at least uh, authority, authority in some level, to come to the assembly and join it like an equal, then it will not be an equal you know, assembly, because a person will have authority. If you have a priest inside of uh, the assembly and starts preaching, and you have Catholics inside, well, you are not free to actually change your mind, because the priest is telling you that you're going to hell or whatever, you know? So there is some, some uh, uh, you need to try to avoid the hierarchies that are outside to get in. So there's some exclusions. So the exclusions, at least from my point of view, should be uh, of position. If you occupy a position of power, you should be excluded. But that exclusion is not about your wealth or your power within you know, society. It's about that specific role that you use. So if you're a politician or you work for a politician and you're a political operator, you try to kind of manipulate the mass, then you shouldn't be allowed to uh, um, participate. Then something that we were talking about, uh, the, uh, the, the way that people talk, because assemblies are all about talking. And if we allow for the people, the you know, the, the classical activists, to monopolize the space of the, the, the word in a way, then you will have a hierarchy within, and also you will not have a critical mass, because activists are very few. Okay, so an activist know everything. So when you go as a newbie, you know, into an assembly, and then you have all these guys, generally men, that you know do speech, then you say, oh, I have nothing to offer. I will not talk, so you don't get engaged. The, the, the way to actually be political is to express your opinion. We know more about ourselves when we express ourselves, so we know ourselves better. So we need to be allowed to talk, everybody needs to talk. And therefore, uh, one of the, 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 the rules that we apply, and we have been actually changes, we have seen changes in the uh, local assemblies, is to apply what is called the progressive list. And this I learned from my union time in the US and from Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, the politician from the, the, the independent politician in the, in the US now, from the Democratic Party, just a functional thing. Um, every time that he goes to a press conference, he says, okay, questions, and he always uh, gives the, uh, the, the, the word, the, the, you know, the, the floor to a woman first, uh, someone from a, from a minority, so not a white male. The white male is not that they are censored, they talk at the end, because they, are, they have an authority in society that other people do not have. So it's not that you're going to shut them up, but you're going to invert the pyramid. Instead of having the best students, and I apply it in my classroom too. So if you say, I have a, when you, know, you make a question, and then you give you know, the floor to the A student immediately, that A student is going to tell you the answer. And all the other people will be quiet, because you all will be answered. But if you give the floor to other person that has another perspective, not very good maybe, but he will be engaging, then all of the people will like to talk. Because if that person that is not of authority talked, you yeah, I can talk too. So you have engagement in that in that moment. But instead, if you only call on the people that are regulars, then all the newbies and all the other people that come from the first time and want to engage will feel uh, threatened and uh, they will not be able to talk. So this progressive list is something that is applied. And actually, I, 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 I want to give talks in the local assemblies. I said, well, I'm going to take questions always like this. And it's a zebra. Um, we do a, a zebra a way of uh, list. So everybody would put their hand up, and uh, we would put the names or you know the the, the, the the names of the people that want to talk. And then we would put a woman, a man, a woman, a man, and with the idea that the people that have never talked or talk very uh, sparsely will talk first, and the people that do all the talking will talk last. And from one assembly that we do that to the second, they double their numbers. And the majority of people that are talking are women who are always uh, undermined. 
Okay, so this is part of uh, some rules that you need to have the pass and have in order to um, allow for the, uh, the, the the equality within this system and not to reproduce or not to violate human rights. So you need limits. It's not that the voice of the people is boundless, as you know the kind of fascist movement uh, wants us to you know engage with. Having just answered two male questions, they were great. I'm going to ask Brother Lauren to ask you a question, then we'll come to you, sir. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, I have so many questions. I choose this one because I think we talk not much about it. And is the positions of security figures in all this democracy uh, proposal um, because they are normally based in preserving the status quo and repressing and oppressing, normally very violent. And I'm not talking only about the police, I'm talking also about. Um, child protection, for example, some of those services are very violent as well against families um, in all countries, <laughs> more than in others. Also prisons, um, all these restrictive institutions that most of the time they pledge to yeah, uh, fight for our security and our protection. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the approach to security this is basic in the sense that there are, there's the trend of uh, wanting to abolish all those kind of structures, right? But actually, we need those structures. We need them, but in a different way. So I think they need to be community based because they need to be more humane. We need to take care of our own, right? And you're right that it's very repressive. So I was thinking about, um, for example, um, rape. Uh, how the state is always coming late. You're going to be raped. Then they're going to investigate who raped you. But basically, you're not going to. They're not going to defend you. This is something that is a, something that is done the same as if they murder you. They're going to investigate your homicide. But then you're already dead, right? So they really come to um, after the fact. And if we see the this history of police, how they were created. They were actually private guards at the beginning. And then they mutated into becoming the state and the security, but they were never there to secure the people's well being. They were there to secure private property. This was the or origin of all police all around the world, okay? not so long ago. Uh, and uh, I think the, the approach here is to have a community based uh, understanding or, or dealing with these problems because it is a social issue that is not going away, not by putting people in jail, is going to, you're going to prevent, you know, crime. This is not, it's proven. Imagine the United States has the more per capita incarcerated people uh, other than, you know, Saudi Arabia, but in the Western world, you know, the, and the majority of them are black, black and brown people. You know, and they are private prisons, people are making money out of this. So it's a very pernicious thing and it really doesn't change the numbers of crime, right? So we need to go back to the community. So how do we solve community problems? Through assemblies. And how can we petition ways of actually having security that it could be organized at a community level? This has to be decided by the people themselves. And people need to take shifts. So one example is I had a work with um, a group of people that didn't have housing. They wanted to occupy a plot of land that was, you know, just you know, like that, open, and of course it was private. So they went and they wanted to set up this community, like a uh, ecological community, and one of the first features that they needed to put in was security, because they were surrounded by people that making uh, dealing drugs, for example, gangs. They also had the police that acts like private guards that want to go on and, and, and get them get rid of them. So they needed to guard. And the and like in the old ways, they had a guard, you know, rotating. So basically the same people that were part of the community needed to take turns in guarding. The same as taking turns of taking the waste out. So, you know, switch. 
Uh, all these other, the, the, the most unpleasant roles need to be, you know, in a rotating basis. So everybody does it. Everybody has empathy for the people doing it, right? And we do it in a, ma in a manner that is humane and is pro community and not from above, from a third party that comes to just repress us. So I think that is, it comes to an, an answer. And in terms of security of the uh, network, because this is an issue, you know, in Chile there's a lot of like infiltration of police and, and surveillance, yeah. So how can we remain uh, secure? And this is a network that should that could be only uh, be based on um, the, your circle of friends or, or, or your, your acquaintances. So in order to get into the thing, you would need to be part of an organization already based somewhere, right? You cannot just add yourself as an individual and kind of infiltrate it. You would need to be vouched by someone. So it's not about having, you know, just registered your name or whatever. You need to be um, approved by your community in order to be part of the community. And the community needs to guard itself. So it cannot be completely open. The openness is actually a weakness. It needs to be open as transparent, in a way, for decisions. However, it needs to guard itself against oligarchic interest, against the police, against infiltration. That is something that actually happens, okay? The uh, trace, the trace of the activists and all these things. So this is something else that we should be taking into account. And this will be the last question. Yeah, I would just like to say that um, that was excellent what you said and what's been contributed so far. Um, but in 50 years now, we're still discussing the same thing. And if you spoke to everybody in the country, and they're all aware, and most people are aware, due to the press reports and what have you, of how we're undemocratic. We've got a democratic um, structure by name, but it's been hijacked by the political class and the establishment. So we don't have what to say. And in 50 years' time, 50 years ago, I was uh, fighting against London Central Government and how the region got a really bad deal. And I've just watched it all the years get worse and worse. Now, how do you turn that into a bias for action? How do we change things? And could it be now, we've got the internet now, and could we not have a, a database like a policy? We can't change the system at the moment. So let's say we had a policy that had a consensus reaching model. We could say for the minority groups that we spoke about, some environmental groups, who are small on their own, but together there's a lot of strength. And if you had any conflicts of interest, you could do consensus reaching. I'll have this model for people to join up to. So you end up with a, a balanced model. You could put forward as a set of policies at the, the next election. You just say, this is what generally the people want. And you get more votes than any other country. And you, you're in a position then to change it. And part of the policy will be to have a citizens assembly. Use the internet. Get everybody who's got a mind to make, to make things change. And do it. Do you think that's a, a way forward? Because we, we could still be talking about this in 50 years' time, unless we have a bias for action to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you bring two solutions to the problem. One is the party, and the other is the citizen assembly. So the party, the problem with the party in general is that the party is um, a, a, a machine, right? And even if we have the best intentions, the party needs to be plugged in to the system and work the same as the other parties. So eventually, it will become the same as the other parties. So how can we create a party that is not a party? At least or how we thought, think about it, right? So one way to think it, and I'm working with, I don't know, you know, the Pirate Party. There are many, you know, around the world, you know, they actually, the mayor in Prague was from the Pirate Party. So they believe in rotation and lottery, right? So the internal governance of the party is not like a party. It's actually a conf confederation of different groups. And you can have, how do you do it? Is to have like a coordination institution, right? A party that is going to have uh, delegates from all the organizations that you have. And they're going to be selected by lot who is going to run, right? So you have no money. You have only community organizing, and you try to minimize all the, you know, uh, oligarchic power sources that are there to threaten the party. So the party as a vehicle. So here I am based um, on Rosa Luxemburg, who at the beginning of the 20th century was writing and was very critical of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, saying, well, the Bolsheviks are the vanguard, and they're not the people. So they came to power. They just like got rid of all the organizations that they didn't like. 
they said yes to the organizations that were pro, you know, Bolshevik, and th those were the people. So the others were excluded. That's not democracy. You need the organizations to mandate you, not the other way around, not the party to command mobilization, but for the organizations to demand things from you and you need to obey. So this is the idea of the instrumental party. So we need to kind of uh, edit the mainframe of the party system and to, of the party structure in order to avoid the oligarchization of power that appears all the time, you know, immediately after you have uh, you, you conform to the structures, okay? On the other hand, you have this new innovation, what is called the citizen assemblies, which are assemblies selected by lot through different categories. So they try to have a representative poll of the people. So in France, for example, they did uh, based on six criteria, class, uh, uh, income, uh, place of, uh, of residence, you know, rural or urban, you know, male, female, religion, profession. They had like many categories and they selected a kind of a, a, a assembly that kind of looked like the people supposedly. Um, that is a technical solution in the sense that you have a parallel structure that um, kind of um, channels the common sense and proposes things to government. The problem is that government then decides not to follow those suggestions, right? Uh, and also is the other problem is that that citizen assembly is 100 people. So that's not the people, right? So how can that be legitimate? And this is a problem because today, the idea of legitimacy is how many votes you have, how many millions you represent. But if you're just a regular citizen selected by lottery, your legitimacy is very low. So what, if you, what, the, what is proposed by the citizen assembly is not of the liking, you're going to say, oh, these people, they were not even elected, you know, they're, who, who are these people, right? So this is a problem as a technical solution to democracy that is, looks like democracy, like the ancient Greece, you know, the lottery and that, but it's not really democracy. The people are not there. So I'm okay with citizen assemblies as a technical solution, for example, for proposing uh, a, a green you know, path uh, for the country to dismantle all you know, the oil control of the economy for a technical solution, like an expert solution, but not as a replacement for democracy. Because if we do that, then uh, those are the institutions that are gonna proliferate, they're gonna make uh, the governance a little bit better, but they, uh, they're not gonna be binding. The governments are not going to, you know, uh, uh, let themselves be bossed around by people that are selected by lot. We're not there yet. But laws and elections are just like mechanisms, right? So in a way, we need to. Those those solutions are technical, and we cannot get the people's power out of the equation. We actually need to give people power, especially now that we have propaganda and it's pervasive. Because the more ignorant we are, the more that the, the more we're prone to be deceived. And to, as Machiavelli would say, decree our own ruin. Okay, this is it's, it's an old story. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have this room until 7:30, which should just hit the 7:30 moments. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you for coming tonight. It's been really special to have you here. Um, I want to thank again Dr. David Jeffries for making this venue possible for us and also for being part of the panel and Andy Gary as well from LCR Pride Foundation for uh, being with us tonight. I was disappointed that Councillor Sarah Doyle uh, didn't come because for me it was really critical, engaged work very hard to make sure we had a politician present, somebody feeding right into the city council to be able to hear this kind of stuff. And uh, Sarah didn't come and she's been elected by somebody here uh, that I expressed my disappointment or that she wasn't in my annoyance. Uh, so I'm going to have to do some work with Sarah to say the annoyance, not with her personally, but with the absence of that particular representation that we wanted to have and that we built into the system of, of our seminar series. So today was the first seminar. The second one, as you can see, advertised is in two weeks' time, where we begin. I like, quite like our banner, where the international word is quite long and then it gets to national, which is a little smaller, and then local, even smaller, which is exactly what we're doing. So the international context becomes next time a narrower national context. We're going to look at similar things, but only looking at examples from the UK. And then finally, the last one, we're going to just talk about Liverpool. And it's very important for us at the last one that we have people mandated or, or sent by the various, we've been, we've been texting, tweeting um, about 70 
different Liverpool-based organisations where people are active citizens because we admire what they do. And there's about two or three here tonight. So it's a very difficult thing. Um, Kevin has talked about that relationship between uh, being in your silo, being active, being very engaged, but not coming to see the bigger picture, which is what we're trying to promote in our seven last years. So thank you so much, Camilla. It was wonderful. Can we give her a really big round of applause?